This week, we're going to talk about reading and writing DNA. We're going to go over technologies to sequence and synthesize DNA. And we're also going to talk a little bit about how data or information is stored or could be stored in DNA. Now, you interact with a lot of data every day. Each text that we send is 50 to 500 bytes of data. The average email is around 10 kilobytes of data. Uh, each photo contains 1.5 to 3.5 megabytes of data. There's also data associated with tweeting or scrolling on TikTok. Um, and as a global population, each of these texts and emails add up to being a pretty insane amount of data. Globally, it's predicted or estimated that we send about 65 billion texts via WhatsApp every day. And that's just one messaging service. So the true number of texts sent each day is probably much, much higher than that. Send about 300 billion emails every day, which is the equivalent of 3.4 million emails getting sent every second of every day. There are about 5 billion photos taken every day and more than 700 or 17 million videos posted to TikTok every day. And all of this information that we generate, all of this data has to be stored somewhere. Some of it is stored locally on your phone, but some of it is stored in the cloud. And, you know, we know that this data is stored because we can go back and access it later, right? I can read text messages that I sent yesterday and look at pictures that I took last year. So we're, you know, have a data store, a looming data storage problem. In 2025, it's predicted that we're going to be generating 33 zettabytes of data each day. And a zettabyte is an insane amount of information. Just for reference today, we usually talk about petabytes of data. And a petabyte of data is a lot of data. It's the equivalent of 20 million filing cabinets completely filled with text, right? If you were to write really densely on a piece of paper, and do that over and over and over again until you filled 20 million four drawer filing cabinets. That's how much um, information is stored in a peta petabyte of data. It's also 13.3 years of HD video. It's just an unfathomably large amount of data. And we're already at the point where we're generating multiple petabytes of data each day. And a zettabyte of data is a thousand times bigger than a petabyte. There's an error in this slide. I'll correct it later. Um, so a zettabyte, 33 zettabytes of data is a lot of data. And the question is, what do we do with all of this data? Where do we store it? Where do we keep our information as a society? Well, some data is stored in storage facilities that look like this. This is actually an image of a Google storage facility data storage center. You can click this link at the bottom of the slide to see a YouTube video where they actually walk you through this center. And what you'll see when you watch the video are rows and rows of servers where there's hard drives storing information that you can uh, query and access from Google's online interfaces. But when you're not looking at your Google Doc or you're not looking at your Google Photo, it's sitting there in one of these data centers just waiting for you to access it. It's not clear exactly how much data is stored in each data, data center, but Google has several of these all over the world. And it's estimated that they currently store about 10 to 15 exabytes of data. And so we will need essentially to increase the amount of data that data storage capacity that we have or start to think more carefully about whether we need, you know, bursts of photos for every situation that we get into. Now, I wanted to just think about the kind of digital data information for a minute and think about how we've stored it so that we can contrast it with how data is stored in biological systems. I want you to think for a second about how much data, how many petabytes or kilobytes or bytes of data it might take in order to encode you. At the moment, no one knows how to do this, right? We don't know how to download our consciousness or translate our consciousness into zeros and ones so that we could live forever as data in one of those Google storage centers. But it's an interesting thing to think about, right? What would it really take to encode a person as bytes of data? 
Well, in some ways we already know, right? In some ways, the instructions to create another one of me uh, is in my DNA. It's in the 23 chromosomes or 3.2 gigabases of DNA. Notice it's gigabases, not gigabytes. In this case, we're talking about A's, T's, C's, and G's. We're talking about the building blocks of DNA. But inside each one of my cells are 3.2 billion of these bases of DNA. And together they make the instructions for me. And DNA, is that's kind of incredible. That's actually many orders of magnitude smaller than the amount of data that um, I generate on a yearly basis. Um, but DNA is an incredible storage medium, right? In this DNA, um, there are about 20 to 25,000 protein coding genes. So in this quarter, we've talked about how, you know, DNA leads to RNA leads to protein. That's kind of the canonical um, central dogma of biology, and yet only our genome only encodes for 20 to 25,000 of these protein coding genes, actually only about 2% of the genome codes for proteins. The rest of it is other information. Some of that information is telling your body or your cells when to express certain genes. So some of that DNA is in promoter and terminator regions that choose basically where to turn on the expression of genes. Here's an example where this is supposed to be a promoter driving expression of a gene that is important for muscle cell movement. And this promoter would basically only be active in muscle cells so that you get efficient muscle movement. You actually don't need the protein that this gene encodes in other cells within the body. And so that's where some of that DNA information is taken up. It's in these protein or these promoter regions, these what we call regulatory regions of DNA. Now, it might seem like that's kind of flat, right? There's just, it just maybe doesn't take a lot to be able to encode for a person. It's not all that complicated to make one if it's just 3.2 billion bases of DNA and some bases are serving to tell um, your uh, polymerase and ribosomes when to translate or, or create a protein from a gene. Like that's not all that complicated, but that's not, it's not that straightforward. There's actually multiple layers of regulation and multiple ways in which a single protein coding gene can produce different proteins um, based on what's happening in their environment. One example of this is called alternative splicing. So if we think about the example that I just showed you where there's this important gene um, for muscle movement, and we you know, think of it as being one gene makes one protein, then there's not a lot of flexibility there. We basically can decide to make that protein or not. We can decide to make a little bit of it or a lot of it. But we're always making that protein in a world where this DNA sequence is always read um, directly. But sometimes um, RNAs are spliced. So there are in human systems um, and actually eukaryotes in general, uh, introns in between the portions of the genome that encode for the protein. So an RNA actually gets spliced together into a um, kind of new form from the form that a polymerase makes into what's called a splice form that is then translated into a protein. And there's actually different ways that you can splice genes together to get different protein products. So here, these bars are supposed to show you different proteins and the RNA or the gene is shown on the left. And so if the RNA, if every intron in a gene is spliced out, you get what's called constitutive splicing and that gives you one protein. But if you get exon skipping, where you splice out this entire pink region then the protein that you make doesn't have the amino acids that correlate to that pink region, you can get intron, uh, retention. So that's here where you get pieces of the intron um, being encoded in your protein. There's also a little bit of that here. And so what, the, what I'm trying to show you is that a single gene can actually encode for several different proteins. So there's some overlap, right? A base doesn't always have the same function um, in every situation, because these alternative splicings can occur under different environmental conditions. Maybe you're running 
And you need to make more of that protein in order to facilitate faster movement of your muscle fibers. And um, the protein form that is usually made is not as efficient as this other protein form. And so you might have alternative splicing where you start making more of this in a, a situation where you're running quickly, just as a hypothetical example. That's um, one way in which information is sort of layered in DNA and it's not in electronic systems. Another way, so, okay, here are um, different forms of the human protein tropomyosin 2 that have been identified to date. And so tropomyosin 2 is an example of a protein that does kind of facilitate the movement of fibers during muscle contraction. And um, you can see that there, this, if this is the full length gene with all of the introns shown as flat lines and the exons shown as boxes, you can see that there are several different splice forms that get made within the human body. So this one segment of DNA, although it looks like it's only encoding for one protein, is actually encoding in this case for at least five or six different types of protein. So I think that's interesting. Another way in which DNA is an information rich carrier is because the shape of the DNA actually can affect gene expression. So like splicing shape is another layer in which information is encoded within DNA. So what do I mean by the shape of the DNA? Well, it turns out when polymerases are actively transcribing DNA, they lead to positive or negative supercoils and positive supercoils on either side of it. So if you've ever played with your shoelaces and you twist them, you can actually get them to coil up. And that's the same type of thing that's happening with your DNA as a, a polymerase is moving along. So you can try this if you take your a cord for something and you twist it a little bit so that you have a little bit of a twist and then you pull, you can get even tighter coiling, right? And if you keep doing that, you can get these super coils to form. And actually proteins like polymerases will preferentially bind to negative super coils and initiate more transcription in parts of DNA that are negatively super coiled. And so it's responding not just to the sequence of DNA, but actually to the three-dimensional shape that it's coiling into as well. And so certain sequences will coil more readily than others. And that's one way or another way in which more information is encoded in these, um, in these proteins. I should say that there are also proteins that actively um, regulate the supercoiling state of DNA. So topoisomerase 2 is an example of a protein that comes through and relaxes these supercoils. Um, so it's you know heavily regulated within your cell what the shape of the DNA looks like. In addition to the sequence, that shape is important for getting good gene expression or um, you know accurately running your genetic program. Okay, so small changes in DNA sequence can dramatically change the phenotype of a biological system. Uh, this is Claude. This is an albino alligator who lives at the California Academy of Science. Um, I've seen him. He's really cute. He has a mutation in a gene that's essential for making melanin, which is a pigment that would usually make Claude a kind of darker brown color. But because he's missing that pigment, he is this nice or kind of intensely white uh, alligator. He's albino. So what is the mutation that causes albinism? Well, uh, we have, I couldn't find the genome sequence for Claude, but what I could find was um, the sequence or analysis of albino zebrafish. So this is a wild type zebrafish, which has these beautiful stripes and an albino zebrafish does not have the capacity to make those striped pigments. So he's um, not striped. And this albino zebrafish has a premature stop codon in a protein that's important for melanin production. That protein is called SLC45A2. And my mouthful doesn't mean a lot, but this um, stop codon means that the gene is not expressed in these zebrafish and a single gene deletion, the missing one protein is causing this um, pretty striking phenotype. Here's just the genome sequence of the wild type zebrafish. This is the codon that would usually encode for a glycine. And when it's mutated, when this first base is mutated to a T like it is in these albino fish, you get a stop codon instead. And so as the ribosome is reading through, it reads this stop and it says, oh, I'm done. And it stops making protein. 
So you get a truncated form of this SLC 45A2 and you don't get the full protein that you need in order to make melanin in these fish. So I thought that was um, a nice demonstration of how important DNA sequence can be and how important small changes can be in the phenotype of an organism. Now, it's not just in the protein coding regions that um, changes in DNA sequence can dramatically alter an organism's phenotype. Here's an example from tomato where the author has made or the scientists made changes in the promoter region upstream of a gene called Clavada 3. These mutations change how strongly Clavada 3 is expressed. So in the wild type, it's expressed pretty strongly. And then as you make more and more mutations, you reduce the amount of Clavada 3 and you get um, uh, different phenotypes here. And so you can see the the fruit locule number or the, kind of the, um, and also the size of the fruit changes as you change the expression of this gene. So this week we're gonna go through DNA reading and writing, right? How do we know that those changes in DNA um, are underpinning those phenotypes. How are we able to observe what the sequence of DNA is, right? We can't um, take it out of ourselves and just like look at it. There are methods for figuring out what the sequence of DNA is. And so we're going to go over kind of the cutting edge of DNA sequencing. And then we're also going to talk about how you can write completely new sequences of DNA. Our reflective questions for the week or for this section are how much data, like let's start thinking about how much data is encoded in all of the organisms you interact with. Um, we have a lot of statistics about how much data you interact with through your phone or through the internet, but how much are you interacting with biotically? And then why do changes in DNA alter living organisms? We talked about how changes may lead to proteins no longer being expressed or to changes in how much protein is being expressed. But are there other things you can think of? And then what are the potential benefits of sequencing an organism's genome? We'll get into this a little bit in the next lecture, but I'd like you to think about it for yourself. What could you learn by sequencing an organism's genome? And then finally, why are people interested in synthesizing new sequences of DNA? What are the potential advantages of being able to do that? All right, I'm excited to talk to you about DNA technologies this week, and I'll meet you at the next lecture.